Well, hey everyone, uh, my name is Juan. I'm from Toronto, Canada, and I work in the real estate industry, uh, traditional like business C environment, and I try to use art for it. Um, and today I'm going to present the uh, chapter four, Ames Housing Data. Um, this chapter was really, really short, so I'm just going to cover a couple of things that what they did in the textbook. And since this uh, chapter was on EVA, uh, I thought it was fun to uh, it's kind of live code. Um, kind of nervous about it, never really done anything like this, but uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, so here's a good meme, right? Um, I don't know if I should load in the tidyverse. Uh, I know we talked about it last week, we wanted to use like individual packages and whatnot, but uh, I'm just gonna load in the tidyverse. Uh, so here's how you load in the AIMS data from the model data package. And what's really nice about it is there's actually a, documentation on this by Max Kuhn. So I, I use this page a lot. Um, so gives you a little data, data dictionary. Um, there were still a lot of really confusing uh, column names. So for example, a uh, bunch of these qualities. So low qual thin SF. I'm going to guess SF is square foot. Uh, sorry, I don't think we see the Oh. that you see so is there anything else than the main r studio window yeah sorry um wow well, can, can you not see it like it's just just r studio yes it, oh. it's just yeah you studio. might be just sharing the window oh, okay uh sorry i'm bad at zoom i'll i'll pop this into the chat though if you guys want to chat so that's the Ames housing uh, documentation. So I'll be going back and forth between this and the RStudio environment a lot. So what I was saying was a couple of column names were really ambiguous to me. Uh, so there's a lot of overlapping uh, column names. If you, uh, so for example, conditions. Yeah, here it is. So basement condition. So it evaluates the general condition of the basement. And this was often left blank. And some of the categorical variables that you want to see in like a nice little factor form were in numerical uh, columns and so on. So I'm going to be touching upon those uh, super quickly after the textbook. Um, so I'll start with the map that the, that the textbook made. Drop a little leaflet. Um, Can you guys see where's another, another window? It's still an, an, another window. So no. we see your R studio, but that you zoomed in, we don't, we don't see that. Okay. You can, if, yes. well, if you feel comfortable, you can share your entire desk, desktop instead oh, of one app. Yeah, I'll do that. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a grandpa when it comes to zoom and stuff uh what about now if i yeah that should work this? yes yeah okay perfect okay so there's a leaflet map and uh textbook points out a couple of things so uh number one thing was um what did i say isolated neighborhoods like timberland so if you look at this neighborhood right here timberland um it's kind of you know, in the middle of nowhere, uh, there's this neighborhood, Green Hills, but really nothing around there. So you might want to uh, keep a close eye on this. Maybe there's a special quality to this uh, little section. Same thing goes with uh, Mitchell and Meadow Village. They're kind of on their own little island. Uh, whereas, like you see, all, all the other neighborhoods, they're kind of tightly packed with each other. Um, so yeah, that's the first thing the textbook brought up. And the second thing was this little neighborhood. So Meadow Village um, is kind of surrounded by this Mitchell neighborhood. And uh, for example, like I don't really see any price differences. So circle size is uh, the sale price. And they seem to me about similar, around $120,000, $130,000. So I'm not sure what's going on. So even in clean data like this, you, you still have some questions, right? 
Um, and the next point is this Crawford neighborhood, this little section. So there's a good chunk of the neighborhood in this little section here, but then you go to the right and find these slightly more expensive, to be honest. Uh, you see 375, 392, whereas over here you see 199, uh, 158, right? So um, I don't know how the districts work in Ames, Iowa, but uh, something that they wanted you to notice. Um, and then there's overlapping neighborhoods like this one, south and west of Iowa State University and Crawford neighborhood kind of cross within each other. So you would expect, I don't know, maybe this street separates everything, but it's really not the case. Um, and you see this quite a bit actually, even in here, uh, this Brown Edwards versus south and west of Iowa State, they kind of cross each other. Uh, they cross each other. Um, Do you know if these districts are like related to like school districts or do you know no why idea. like they blend? Okay. Maybe they, maybe they said it in the neighborhood. Physical locations within AIM city limits. Is anyone from Iowa here <laughs> or no? The lived US in Iowa, Iowa before, <laughs> like an hour south of AIM. Oh, really? It's Where, not uh, a very big place. Where were you? Ankeny. Uh, you have to direct me here. <laughs> uh, not, I was south. Not in here? Like, no, not in there. Okay. I was in like a suburb of Des Moines. Okay. Like an hour south of that. Um, but Ames, I'm yep. guessing it only has. has mm, I would think there. There's 66,000 people that live there. It's very small. Okay. Well, you can look it up. I don't see any wiki page on the district, so I, I have no I have no idea completely honest, but yeah. I, I don't know how they separated it. But yeah, I mean moving forward though, like so you see this everywhere, right? Overlapping neighborhoods, old town, sixty-four thousand for a home. Anyways, um yeah, it's it's crossing over to this neighborhood. Um, also, one thing I thought was super interesting was this neighborhood right here, Vinker. So separated into two different sections, right? I mean, uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. So south of the, of the creek, you have a little more expensive houses, 385, 373. And then you, you, go, you go north of the river, you see, you know, slightly more, slightly less expensive homes. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and that's about all the EDA I did on the map. Does anyone have any, if anyone's looking into this data set or have any question, I'll, I'll pause here. Okay. So that's a map that the chapter sketched. And the next thing they looked at was the um, uh, sale price. So what we're gonna eventually try and predict. Um, so the way I'd like to look at a numerical variable when I'm doing an EDA is kind of do something like this. So I'll call the data set and then summarize by whatever uh, metric I wanna look at. So I can do mean of sale price, I can do median of sale price, min, max, whoop. Right, so these are, I'm gonna cover Skimari later, so they're gonna show up there, but um, just a quick little high-level summary of what you're looking at. So I can say on, on average, you, uh, houses in Ames, Iowa are 180K, and then the most expensive one went for 755 and, and so on. So what's interesting is the distribution of the sale price. So I, I, it's a histogram of the sale price and you see it's uh, right skewed with long right tail and the minimum value as we saw up here was 127. So 
we can safely apply a log transformation on the sale price because we have uh, the minimum is still positive. So what, what you'll see is, is this. I did two things here. Uh, just one of them is a scale on the, on the x-axis. And then the other one is actually mutated the uh, sale price. And they show the same thing, right? So log um, 100,000 100, 100, is 10 to the power of five and, and so on. So it looks pretty normal. Not, it's not a perfect distribution, not a perfect normal distribution, but it's close enough. And this is what the book wants you to know mainly in this chapter. Going forward, we're gonna, we're gonna use the log transform sale price um, to predict things. So that's about everything that the book wanted you to know in this chapter. Um, anybody have any questions before I do some EDA? Okay. All right. So kind of cheated here. I have a little outline that I wanted to cover. So this is my general um, EDA philosophy. I, I look at what, what kind of columns I have, and then I ask myself a bunch of questions. So I have two questions that I kind of thought of before the meeting. Um, I want to focus on the neighborhood. So where are these houses selling? At what prices? Um, do we see any patterns within specific uh, neighborhoods versus the others? And number two is, you know, uh, is, an, is an older home typically bigger or you know, does it affect prices? Maybe there's a renovation here that you can throw in there. So I'd like to start with a question after looking into what kind of columns I have. And a good way to do that is a skimmer. So do skimmer. Um, for those of you that don't know skimmer, it's a really nice handy tool it gives you a high level summary of the other data you're working with so it gives you the dimension what kind of columns you have so we have 40 factors so characteristics character columns and then 34 numeric columns and then based on this breakdown it gives you another uh set of summary so and missing that's really nice you see uh how many column how many rows you have missing in the uh in the column and in this case we we don't see any, it's everything's 100% completed, even in the numeric. So that's really nice to see. We don't have to impute anything or uh, make any decisions. Um, in the, sorry, in the, in the character variables, you also get the n unique, so unique values. So neighborhoods, 28 neighborhoods, um, and nor something is uh, one of the top, top counts. And, and so on. Um, and in the numeric, this is what I was doing earlier with the summarized mean. Uh, gives you a mean standard deviation, a uh, bunch of different percentiles, and a nice little histogram, which I really like. So if you look at year built, it's got a nice little left skew. So most houses were built uh, recently, uh, rather than later, back in, back in, the, back in the history. Um, and you, when, when you see something like this, this kind of distribution, it, it tells me like, Okay, these are probably either like zero or one that I probably want to convert to a, a categorical variable. So wood deck square foot, I, I bet you a bunch of them are zeros and only some of them have wood decks. So I would almost convert it to a, um, a categorical, whether, uh, whether a house has a wood deck or not. Same thing with pool area. Um, how many houses actually have pools, right? So. So, you know, just a quick little skim of the, of the whole data is what I'd like to start with. And um, yeah, the question I wanted to ask you guys is when you have 75 columns like this, 74 columns like this, it's quite a bit, right? I mean, so what are your strategies uh, when you um, see a large data set like this? So my strategies are uh, groups the columns together that I think are similar and even just look at a correlation map between variables. But before I dive into those, I, I want to hear you guys' opinions on what your strategies are. I mean, one thing that we do in health data, since it's not, since it's traditionally not like throw all the variables in and see what happens, um, 
you usually create models from like the simplest and you add in groups of variables. So you, so like you might say like, here are all the variables that are related to demographics. So that might be like age, occupation, whatever. And you add all of that into your model at one go. So you find like variables that are blocks and then you add that into your model. And then you can do things like if it's like a, a linear model, you can compare the F scores and do an F statistic to see if that group of variables was significant instead of just adding one variable at a time. So that's something that we do in health data sets. Okay. Anybody else? I'd love to hear from everybody, actually. I would say I don't generally work with big, <laughs> big data in terms of variables, more like spatial and temporally big. So I don't really have a good strategy. Okay. Just make um, a lot of plots is usually what I do. Yeah. Lots that's, and lots and lots. That's what I find myself doing, to be honest. Like I make stupid amount of plots before I even do anything, uh, trying to understand the data. Um, can I like call everybody like individually? Like I, I want to hear from everybody. Like uh, what about you, uh, Ildiko? Uh. Yeah, to be honest, I haven't worked with data, I think that much variables, but I would probably start with correlation plots. So, so I had maybe 20 variables or something like that. And then, then it was very helpful to somehow try to, try to decrease the amount. Uh, I had some, so actually when I did some modeling, it was usually like, I had to collect the variables, so we maybe we had the so so it's it's not like a given data set, but but you just try to collect if if something see, seems useful, and then you you won't end up with with seventy five variables because that would be a lot of work. Okay, uh, Edgar, do you have anything to say? Um, I think in addition to skimmer, another one I like is the core plot function. I think the like yeah, the, the I, I love that actually. Yeah, that one is very helpful. Like if I think there are some variables that I think have some you know type of relationship, I start off there, and then like there's a core a set of I'm in education, and so there are some core sets of like you know you want to predict GPA, you want to look at like course load and. Uh, if you take a math course in the first quarter and kind of like their fundamentals and then from there kind of expand outward with like the correlation. But I think correlation plot and skimmer are, are, are ones to start off with. Okay. Um, Hannah, what about you? Oh, okay. I don't think I can can't hear, hear you. you. How about now? There you go. Okay. Well, I think the most important bits have already been covered. So loads of plots. I guess it does make sense to look at your data before you go in. I do that as well. Skimmer is nice. Correlation plots are nice. I think the sort of guidelines that they put at the end of the chapter are helpful in terms of, well, you look at your outcome you look whether you have correlated predictors, you have look like both the correlation within the predictors and the correlation to the output. Because if there's nothing correlated to your output, you might not get very happy. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, uh, Chris, what about you? Chris said that his audio might not work today. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Um, okay, yeah, I'll kind of get back on track, I guess. So uh, what I like doing is I like uh, this matches function. So I look at column names and I group them with each other. So we have this many columns and I'll sort it actually. Um, 
So you see some common patterns here, right? So there's conditions everywhere, cond, cond, uh, whatever. And then there's years everywhere, year remove, uh, rent. I'm gonna guess that's remodeling, uh, remodeling ad, year sold, year built. Um, there's different areas, pools, lot area. Um, yeah, but you know, as you might guess, like some of these probably are really correlated with each other. So they're redundant. So I don't know, I don't know if the book goes and does the, does it see a PCA later, but that's something I would keep in the back of my head. Um, I would probably want some kind of a dimensionality reduction. Um, but yeah, um, for numeric variables, I like to do a faceted histogram of the, uh, uh, of their values. So, what I like doing is I'll take just the matches uh, area. So that gives me these guys, lot area, mass veneer area, greater living area, uh, garage and pools. So what are their distributions like? There we go. Oh, so I like to pivot it. Um, get a nice little long data and I like to facet it. Value, measure, I'll fill it. Geo histogram, bins 50. That's a wrap by measure. So to make this a little better, I like to do scales, scale, scale is free. And then I like to factor reorder them. Uh, measure is actually two, reorder, measure by value. Right, pretty nice. Um, so you get the nice little overview of the five different uh, numeric measures. And like, like I guessed earlier, pool area, probably zero. Um, I can throw this into a ggplotly and kind of hover over the points and see what they really are, but I think that's zero. So vast majority of pool area is zero. So not a lot of people have pools. Garage area, I think that's normally distributed-ish around the 500 uh, median. Uh, also, a lot of people don't have garages, which is pretty surprising to me in a home sale. Um, living area, you see the same distribution as the sale, sale price. So they're probably really correlated with each other. Um, that little right skew. Uh, same with lot area, you see a bunch of low ones, and then you, you see some of these massive houses. So that's how I look at numeric variables sometimes. Um, and then for the categorical, I like to use the tidy text package. There's a function called um, reorder within. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, so aims okay. uh, select matches. So I'll look at the conditions. Right. So condition one, two overall condition, exterior condition, basement condition. This is an integer, so I'll exclude it actually. Select minus second lower side. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and break down these guys. So uh, I bet you most of them are just normal, but we'll see what we get. So same thing, mutate, I give it an ID. Uh, Row number, pivot it, minus ID, measure, but what, uh, 
you have to do an extra step here because they're uh, categorical. Doesn't give you a uh, you have to give to count it actually to see how many instances of them uh, there are. So I'll count it. Should I count measure and value? Uh, we'll start there. And then uh, same thing, ggplot, as uh, val. I want to do n value. Fill. Measure. So we're just going to call. Pass it by uh, measure. And then I want to set the scale to free. Okay. Yeah, so this is okay, but I mean, it's pretty tough to read, right? So what I want to do with the tidy text package is uh, sort them within their own measure. So the way you do that is um, in here, you can say value is reorder within. Uh, let's see if I can get it right. Value and measure. So you want to line up the values. You want to reorder the values by their counts within their respective measures. So what that'll do, um, and you want to do scale y reordered. Let's go. Okay. So yeah, it, it, it lines it up within the, within the measures. So like, uh, like I said earlier, they're all typical. They're normal. They're normal. Typical, typical, average, normal. So uh, nice little way to kind of quickly go through these and kind of confirm what you had in mind is uh, I like using facet plots. Is Y reordered part of tidy text or ggplot? This is tidy text, I believe. Yeah, tidy text. Reorder a column before plotting with faceting. Oh, actually, if you. Um, just call this, it gives you a weird little notation. So I don't know what the implementation behind this is, but um, yeah, they kind of uh, factor reorder with the uh, measures attached to the values and then they do something with it. Yet again, I, I, I don't know how it works, but I do use it. Uh, any questions so far, comments, concerns? Okay. So yeah, that's my strategy number one. Um, I just look at columns, uh, kind of group them together, uh, what I think are similar, and uh, I go from there. So uh, sorry, one one question about the conditions. So was it uh, an unordered, unordered factor? So I was just thinking about that these these conditions are probably like. I don't know, pool is worse than normal and better is, or good and fair are better, so. They were ordered, if I remember correctly. Aims, uh, can I do strength? Yeah, they're all factors, so they, they do have levels within them, um, but I just uh, switch around the Y with, a, y with an N based on their counts. I think that's what I did. Um, so, cause you know how, how the factor affects the factor and the levels affects the ordering of the columns when you plot it. So that's basically what I did. Mess around with the levels of the, of the factors. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. Uh... Uh, partially, yeah. I, I mean, I was just thinking that it might, might be interesting to see. I don't know if there are a lot of, quite a lot few categories then to see the normal ones, the worse than normal, and the better than normal, if, if there's a possibility for that, but maybe it's it's not possible. Yeah, if anyone wants to comment on it, who's read the chapter, go ahead, but I haven't dug in that far yet. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, next is a correlation map. Um, I'm not gonna live code this because I'm not gonna remember this. But uh, 
you basically get a correlation matrix of the, I, I just took the numeric ones. I haven't converted the categorical ones to the dummy variables or whatnot. Um, and I like to throw it in a ggplotly so I can kind of hover over them and see what's available. So that pops up right in front of my eye right there. That red 0 0.9 correlation, garage areas and garage cars, makes sense. You have more cars, you have more, you have more area. Um, that's red. First floor square foot and total basement square foot are positively correlated. Makes sense, I guess. Um, and then this column right here, this red, uh, red little strip is our sale price. So it's correlated with a lot of things. Um, so living area is obviously a big one. Uh, a lot of different square footages. Um, year, interestingly, uh, as, you, as you get to more recent homes, they tend to be more expensive. Uh, and then there's a the cold ones. So if enclosed porch. So if you have a porch, it's okay. I bet you that's the thing I was talking about. Um, the need to convert these numeric vectors or numeric uh, columns into a uh, categorical ones. Uh, enclosed porch. So I'll count it. Yeah, see what I mean there? Like zero is most of the data. Um, so that's why I think it uh, correlation is that way um, because you have so much zeros, uh, it just drives down the correlation. Um, look at some of the cold ones. So that pops up to me, 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5 between basement full bath and basement finish square foot one. The documentation. What was it? Uh, it full bath. Basement thin. That's uh, type one finish square foot. Don't know what that means. Um, and then full bath. So I'm, I'm going to guess that's full bath. Where was I? Uh, yeah, basement full bathrooms. So I don't know why they're negatively correlated, but I guess that kind of goes and show you, because you would think, right? I mean, if you have more square footages in the basement, you would have more bathrooms. Um, but maybe it's bad data. I don't know. But um, it's part of the EDA, I guess. So yeah, that's how I use a heat map. Um, usually, um, I, I I plot it in a plotly and just see what's hot and what's cold. Um, does anyone have any other strategies when they're using a, a correlation map like this? Okay. How would you do this? For, can you do this with non-numeric? values yeah you can but you have to convert them into a dummy i think okay uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i just haven't done that step here because i would imagine the type of like whether it's like a condo or like an apartment i, I don't know if this data set has that in there i think it does building type so, yeah that's what i figured it out so i mean that might because when you brought up the like pool area that might not be those all those ones without pool areas or small garages might just be apartment condos. Right. Or um, duplexes or something like that. Also what I like doing, and speaking of that is, uh, I like counting multiple things at the same time. So pool, well, let's do pool. Um, so this gives me well, single family homes have non-zero pool area, whereas all the other ones have zero. That's pretty interesting to me. Um, only the single family ones have pools. You would think like a townhome may have a pool or not, but not in names, I guess. Um, also, I didn't see any apartments here. Two family condo, maybe that's a condo. Well, yeah, only the single family homes have, have pools, which, and only one, what is it? 12 of them? 
13 of them, all different sizes. So this, like I was saying, you might want to convert this into a yes or no, a half pool variable, but um, that, that's just me. Um, yeah, so there's the correlation map. Um, so I'll start answering some of the questions I have in mind. So I'll, I'll hide this. So I like column graphs and box, box plots for looking at distributions. So which neighborhoods sell at most at what price? Uh, give myself a little hint there. So I wanted to look at, is there a rich neighborhood basically? That's a question I wanted to answer. So how I'll go about doing this is I would group by um, neighborhoods. Summarize count is N. Uh, then let's look at median price. Median price is median uh, sale price. Yep. Sale price. I'll group it. Okay. Um, GG plot, AS, uh, um, median price. Neighborhood. That's GM call. Okay. And then I want to fill it with the median price. Uh, oh, sorry, I did the wrong thing. Count and then fill by median price. And then I want to factor reorder again. Oh, neighborhood. Neighborhood. So that the most um, most amount of sales pop up first. Neighborhood by count. That should work. Right. So this is the count of number of sales by neighborhoods filled by median price. So if you look at North Ames, they sold by far the most houses, but are on the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to prices. And when you look at communities like Northridge Heights, Stonebrook, um, Northridge, they didn't sell as much as North Ames did, but they do go for a lot more. Um, so where, was, where were these guys again? Um, we had the map. North Ames, that's a poor area. Most sales, pretty big, right? So it makes sense. Um, most sales, but not too expensive. Um, Northridge Heights, it's over here. Um, pretty big. But yeah, they, they sold for a lot more than the other houses. And Northridge here, uh, they also have expensive houses. Stonebrook was one of them. So it, okay, it seems to me all the houses in the north are typically more expensive than the rest of the community. Um, yeah, um, I don't know the demographics around there, but that seems to be the case, okay. uh, which is interesting. Um, Box plot of price distribution by neighborhood. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just forget a box plot super quickly. Um, Ames, uh, can I recycle this? Oh, I don't have to, okay. Let's throw them straight into ggplot. Um, neighborhood. Neighborhood, uh, sale price. Let's do it. order neighborhood by sale price and median oh there you go if i do this and hide the legend the legend is false okay that looks a lot nicer so 
similar observation we saw in the graph here, the bar chart. Um, Stonebrook, Northridge Heights, uh, and Northridge are at the top. Um, whereas you see some of these uh, Meadow Village, Briardale, Old Town, uh, they're on the lower end of the spectrum. Come on, think of it, Meadow Village. That was the enclosed one, right? That was this one. Yeah. Um, so the lowest price neighborhood, and what was the Mitchell? Mitchell, okay, that's pretty interesting to me. Mitchell is, I wouldn't say significantly higher, but like they're, you know, pretty, they have a sizable gap between Mitchell and Meadow Village, which are directly next to each other. So I wonder what's going on there, like that little street. Um, maybe they have a, a bad reputation. I don't know, but yeah, that's pretty interesting to me. It's just one street, Meadow, uh, Meadow Place. Yeah, maybe there's something going on here that, that, I don't know, that I don't know about, but the price seemed to be different than here and the outside. Oh, okay. So that was question one, which neighborhoods sell the most and what prices? There you have it. Uh, the north of Ames seemed to be a lot more expensive than the rest of the communities. Um, yeah. So the next question I wanted to answer was, which neighborhoods have the oldest homes um, and does it affect prices? So since we looked at box charts already, I'll, I'll do a, a Geoma density ridge, which is a pretty cool function. Similar idea, but it gives you a nice little plot like this. Um, so that's year going across and then neighborhood uh, to the left. So Northridge Heights, I think that was one of our more, more expensive ones, uh, seemed to be new. They, most of the homes were built after 2000. Um, same with Stonebrook, which is a, a expensive, expensive neighborhood. Um, Meadow Village, the lower priced ones, they, they're not too, too old. They're mostly around the 1970s, I wanna say. Yeah, but they're, they're not the oldest uh, community out there. Old Town is. <laughs> um, where was Old Town? Oh, right there. Yeah, so these are older homes, but I don't think they were too cheap. Was it? Yeah, they sold a lot. Um, I mean, they're cheap, I guess. But yeah, they did sell a lot. And they're really old homes, which is, uh, which is interesting, I guess. Yeah, basic um, year built versus sale price uh, uh, scatter plot. And then I'll, I'll throw in a smoother, um, I don't know, linear method. Right, increasing trend. You, you, you obviously see more new homes uh, sell for more expensive prices. Other than this guy, I don't know what this is. Oh, okay. Cooler. Can I say group is oh, it's a color. Yeah, I just want to know what, what neighborhood that is. Non produced. Why? Old town. Old town. 475. Built in 1892 and went for $475,000. Um, okay. I wonder why though, why, why, why did it go for so much? So I'll do Ames filter neighborhood is old town and sale price is 475. What? Oh. 
I'll view it. I like this window a lot. Um, I, I think it's really clean. Yeah, let's dig into this. Okay, two and a half story. Uh, it's a medium density. It's pretty big. I don't know what measure that is in. Uh, one single family home. Excellent condition. 1892 it was built. They renovated 100 years after. <laughs> um, I wonder what they did. Uh, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the like materials and sidings, uh, but if these mean anything to you, shout out to me. Exterior condition is good. Um, typical basement condition, it's unfinished. Okay, here's the square footages. Um, you have 1,100 square foot of basement, which is a lot. And then you have the total living area of 3,600. So it's a huge home that sold for uh, 475. That makes sense to me. It's a, uh, we saw living area and the sale price kind of correlated with each other. So um, that makes sense to me. Next set of columns, what do we have? It was sold in 2006. Um, no pool, they have a fence. And yeah. Um, that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. I'll, I'll just kind of stop here and then uh, maybe if we want to have some discussions. Thank you very much for it was very courageous of you to do a live <laughs> demo and you did it really well. So I was pretty nervous to be honest. <laughs> so my what? question is you can like do so much EDA and you can continue to do, you know, on every single variable. At what point do you feel like satisfactory and like I know enough of the data and like enough of what's going on to then proceed on to, you know, the modeling aspect of it. Um, you know, definitive, like, or do you have like a checklist? Is, like, do you guys use a checklist or like, I want to check out these things and then, you know, I think I'm good. For me, I, yeah, I like to have a checklist. I have some set of questions that I wanted to answer uh, before I started. Um, and then once I get those, and if I don't get more questions, I kind of move on, but, uh, yeah, what does everybody else think? Tough crowd today. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I, I, I haven't done much modeling, so, so I, I can't really say that I, I usually do this or that, so. I know I, I should always maybe do more. I think what's, what's really important to cover is a lot of the times you have missing data or, or something that's maybe suspicious. And I think it's, it's really important to understand that, but maybe to, to explore correlations, you can, you can also do that via modeling partially. What do you do, Edgar, um, in terms of EDA and moving on to the modeling? I think for me, for what I've done, I usually start with, I think I like the, um, those box plots. I think I get a lot from that. And I think I start with the box plots and I think the move on to the correlation. You know, I think that correlation plot gives you an idea of what to include and, you know, what to exclude. You know, some variables may not, you know, have any relevance or relationship. And I think trimming down your variables from like 75 or whatever we had in Ames down to like maybe something that's more reasonable, I think is, is a good strategy. And then I think I try to limit it and I don't want to, you know, dig too much into the weeds because I mean, you can find one offs and stuff like that, but I try to stick to like the same game plan throughout. But I think what you covered is like a good strategy. And I think it's a, 
you know, going forward is something that, you know, I'll take. Uh, I think it's a good layout where it's not too in-depth, but it's, you know, good enough to, you know, really see any anomalies or anything like that. Chris is saying here, I sometimes end up coming back to EDA after doing some modeling. So try not to worry too much about covering everything. Yeah, I agree with that actually. Like you, you'll kind of have like a, an idea of what you want to do with modeling. You kind of continue with it and then you, you, you find something that's stopping you and then you go back to the EDA. It's like, oh, I shouldn't have done it, right? Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. So just uh, looked up. So that one house that was sold for four seventy five. Yeah. I think that's a historic. I think that's a historic district. Oh, okay. So they're like it's a historic home. I think everything in that. I guess it's on the registry as a historic district in Ames. So that might be why. I think it got in two thousand four. It was put on the registry for historic places. So that might be why you saw like two years later the uptick in price because now it's like technically historic. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> 